WPC. So we're going to start off the last panel here uh, with a talk on liners by Pedro Guarisma from Baker Hughes. Okay, uh, good afternoon. My name is Pedro Guarisma. I work for Baker Hughes. I've been working with Baker Hughes for uh, about 21 and a half years, and I've had the, uh, the pleasure and the distinction to, to work um, internationally in Venezuela, Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, uh, Malaysia, Australia, uh, a couple of times in, in uh, Malaysia, a couple, couple of times in Brazil. So when, uh, uh, for me, I, I just want to thank the, for the, uh, the opportunity to present here. Uh, the topic that I will be covering is uh, well liners, well liners integrity. And I, I just wanted to uh, start out with an introduction on, on some similar projects, maybe in more demanding uh, conditions that I've had the opportunity to work with. Uh, one of them is a um, uh, high pressure gas injection project where uh, the operator was injecting uh, gas at 9,000 9, PSI at the wellhead. And uh, it was for a pressure, reservoir pressure maintenance uh, application. So, so, so in, in, that, in that experience, I had the opportunity to be exposed to and had to work on uh, the, the downhole equipment, the downhole completions equipment, also the safety system, safety valves, subsurface, and also at the surface actuators, and then also with the control systems and all the logic uh, that was set up for the different failure modes um, to shut in the well in the case of emergency, either by fire, by overpressure, by loss of, of, of control on, on the well. Another interesting project that's kind of related uh, was in Peru. It was a, a cam camisea, which is a big bore gas uh, production project. On that one also, um, it's large volumes of gas being produced, downhole safety valves, um, actuators at surface and uh, control systems at surface. And uh, the last one relevant to this that I've worked on was uh, CO2 uh, injection, which is very critical because um, like, 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 like you know, if, if, you, if you get uh, gas uh, migration to surface, it's, it's very critical. So it's a very interesting project where there was um, CO2 injections that were drilled. There were water producers that were drilled to allow the reservoir to accept the CO2, and that water that was produced was later re-injected in other wells. And this was a, because this was a grade A natural reserve, and um, it's a completely balanced system that did not have any, any effluence in, into the environment. And the CO2 injection, the purpose of that was uh, sequestration and just to reduce emissions. And that, 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 that was uh, the operator's uh, goal. So with that said, and unfortunately, I miss the, the, the first days of the, of the meetings, of the presentations. You may have seen something similar. So I'm going to try, and from what I've heard today, uh, to, to, to bring a, um, a different approach. In the, I see that FEMSA is PHMSA. And in the oil industry, there are a lot of acronyms. And then one that um, a colleague mentioned recently was S-C-I-N-E, which stands for sometimes cement is not enough. So <laughs> that's what one of the things uh, that... Uh, here I am. So here's the introduction. I'll be talking about uh, the opportunities uh, for well construction integrity when you originally build a well, and then uh, if, if you already have a well and you want to remediate it, um, there, there are some examples. So for uh, liner integrity, uh, of course, uh, in a new well, um, casing a liner uh, design, the main objectives of a casing liner design is to ensure that the well has mechanical integrity um, make sure that you take into consideration uh, all the loads in the life of well. Could be production, injection, stimulation, um, and contingencies. 
Of course, your tubulars, casing liner tubing, have to exceed those uh, loads in the life of the well. And of course, uh, we don't have pockets so deep that, that, that we can put uh, Cadillac or, or high-flying high uh, materials, et cetera. So it has to be cost efficient for it to work. Um, other things to, uh, to consider that, that, that are considered during uh, liner uh, casing design are the performance, mechanical performance, which is our burst, collapse, and tensile. And um, another factor is uh, the material selection. Material selection has to do, again, there are some API, API standards and the mechanical properties that I mentioned, but also chemical properties. What fluids are going to be injected into that well? What is it going to be produced if it's, if it's going to be injected? Is it, are you going to have inhibitors if it's uh, in, in the fluid form, et cetera? And the connections uh, required, gas tight, uh, tensile, the loads, combined loads uh, for, for the tubing and the casing. So those are the things that, that you need to look at on a, on a, on a new drill, on a, on a new well. Uh, additionally, as, as I mentioned with the acronym, sometimes cement is not enough. Uh, we, we require other forms of um, isolation to control um, flow and isolation in a well. I've identified um, three, which is uh, open hole annulus isolation. This is the isolation from your, from your casing to the well bore. The most common that some of you may know of is uh, inflatable packers. Uh, casing packers that uh, above a, a, a shoe of a, of a casing string or a liner string to avoid that you get migration of uh, injected fluids up into uh, past uh, the um, and, and contaminate your cement, et cetera, et cetera. So open hole uh, isolation systems are used. I'm going to have two controls here. Uh, if, if, if you have a risk of a primary cementing job going bad, but you also have other uh, applications for, for those. If you want to isolate water contacts or oil, gas caps or gas migration, um, either um, zones, interzones, casing shoe, to pre preventing cross flow in some applications of production, and some segment production or injection wells. Uh, available um, systems. Uh, traditionally, the, the, the oldest system is the inflated, cement inflated ECPs. These are mounted on the casing. And, and, and in your cement job for your casing, um, w once you land your plugs, that cement would, would go into the, um, into the element here. Uh, with, the, with the development of technology, now we have several types. Now we're talking about swell packers, which is a re reactive element packer. The, these are um, elastomers that are designed either to swell in the contact of water or in the contact of uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, you also have some that, that are expandable, and I'm going to be talking about expandable uh, cladding in, in, the, in the remedial portion. Uh, so they're expandable to contact the, the casing or the open hole but additionally, they, they, they react, so, so they also swell. So, so that gives you a positive seal. Um, I'm going to talk about positive seals um, in, the, in the other, in, in the other uh, isolation devices. This is a mechanical set, which is, it works hydrostatically, so it has an uh, atmospheric chamber. And once it's installed in the well uh, with a shifting tool, or any other shearing mechanism, you activate it. So uh, the fluids in the well uh, flood the, the, uh, the hydrostatic chamber and it sets the packer. Inflatable reactive, this is like a double, double whammer because you, you have it, it, it is inflatable, but it, the core is reactive. And the fluid that you use to inflate it, it contacts the formation and then the core actually absorbs that water and it swells and it gives you a positive seal. So all these, all these devices 
are used to, uh, to give you a seal besides the cement uh, from your casing into the formation. Another type of isolation is mid-string. Mid-string means that you have two strings of casing. You can have casing liner or two strings of casing. And um, th the development of this is that uh, this, is, this is the size of your, of your casing that you're running, and you have another casing here on the back side, and this is going to seal that casing, and it's going to give you a positive seal. Uh, today, um, some of you, uh, some of the presenters mentioned integrity, positive seals. I mentioned positive seals, or I think of a positive seal is a, a seal that is effective, effective meaning that, it's, that you can test it and, and you know that it's holding pressure. Two, that is um, reliable, uh, effective, reliable, and then uh, good for the life of the well. Okay. So with this type of uh, is mid-string isolation, you can uh, isolate annuluses that, that, that you're running. Uh, currently, uh, I'm working on an application where we have uh, 18 and 5 eighths is, is the nominal, and it sit, it, it's going to seal in a 24-inch surface casing. And then also another one, which is 9 and 5 eighths nominal, sealing in a 13 and 5 eighths uh, casing. What that means is that you have that annular area in your it could be your A, uh, yeah, in, in your A or B annulus, depending on when, when you're constructing it. You, you can set these, these type of packers so you're not relying solely on the cement. Um, another opportunity to, to, to seal, to have integrity, positive seal, is between casing and liner strings. Um, some, uh, a lot of wells have, you have surface casing, you have a drilling casing, and sometimes you have a liner when you do not want to carry the, case, the, the, the tubulars up to surface. So when you have a liner, it's also important that you protect that liner top. Why? Because you're cementing that liner in place, but again, cement, uh, I think it was Adam that, that, that mentioned, all the correct characteristics that a, that a cement fo formula needs to meet for it to be effective. So. So it, having the opportunity to seal that liner top, if, if you have the opportunity, go ahead and, and, and do that. And that's going to avoid, again, uh, migration of, of any type of communication from, from, the, from the, the, the OD of here with that, that you have another casing, but ultimately you have a reservoir down below uh, in, into your, the, the top of that liner. So this is typically run uh, with the liner assembly. It has a, a larger bore polish here that you can tie back. And, and when you tie back that to surface, we consider that if it's for production or injection, uh, you, we consider it a monobore completion. So, so, so that's one application where if you're trying to minimize your ID reduction in a well, you can run a liner hanger. For example, if this is a seven set in nine and five eighths, this idea is seven and three eighths, and then you would have seven inch all the way to surface as your, as your completion tubing for injection or production. Okay, so that covers uh, when you're well constructing, when, when, when you have the opportunity to, to do that. I, I pulled these, um, these three examples of remedial casing. So um, one, I'm just gonna go directly into it, Expandable cladding. Uh, expandable cladding is used uh, at, for casing repair. If you, if you have perforations in your casing, uh, you've done some squeeze cementing, they're not being effective, etc. You have the opportunity to run expandable systems where you, you, run, you run in, you, it has a smaller diameter, and when you're at, at, at your position, you expand that, uh, that solid expandable it can have seals on the OD, and you isolate perforations or long sections of corroded casing. So here's the detail. I'm not going to read them, but you can use it for damaged casing, shut off perforations. You can wrap 
uh, elastomers on the OD, long, long, long corroded section, variable lengths. The, the advantage of, of expandable cladding versus other methods that, that, that I'm going to, the other two methods or, or applications I'm going to cover is that typically you, you only lose about half an inch on the ID. So, so, so that is, is definitely an advantage. Here is uh, basically how it works. It's a, in the case of Baker Hughes, it's top to, to, top to bottom deployment. It's hydraulic. You run to depth. You pressure up. That pressure anchors uh, the, the anchor. It anchors into the casing. And then the, uh, the stroking tool moves down and starts expanding uh, this clad. Once it's finished, if it's a longer section, what you do is, is you release the pressure. You move down, you contact your, your swedge to, to your clad, you anchor again, and you continue stroking until you expand the, the, the complete length. And then after that, you just pull the system out of the well, no, no need to drill, drill out or anything. Here, this information is going to be available. Typical 723 pound, with, which has 6.3 ID. Uh, pop, 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 pop. Pre-expansion, post-expansion ID, 6.7. Uh, so, so, so you are maintaining, you're minimizing the loss of ID for applications where you need to um, have high volumes. This I, I brought up also from an application that we did in, in Peru. And it was uh, older wells in, in, the, in the Peruvian jungle. Um, that uh, were damaged and they needed to uh, to recover those wells to do hydraulic fracturing pro uh, project. So basically what we came up with was th there were uh, seven inch wells and we ran in as considering that we were an open hole. So, so we ran in a, a standard liner hanger inside a seven inch well where we set the, the hanger, we cemented everything in place. So that means now we have a new well. Now we have uh, the pressure characteristics or, or yeah, the, the, the pressure of, of, of the new case, of the new liner. So, so they had an old liner that was corroded, et cetera. They had done some repairs that didn't work, so we just, ran, we just ran this again inside, cemented everything in place, reperforated, and they can do the job. So I, I have two options here. One is where you do that cementing all the way from the bottom to the top. Another one, you have perforated liner here. If, 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 you, if your bottom section, your injection section or producing section is already perforated, nothing is wrong with that. You can cement above that through this valve, and then you maintain contact with the reservoir here. And the last uh, remedial scenario that I have here is using these mid midstream packers that I talked about, uh, using them to do a straddle. And then again, I'm, I'm giving you an example here on 723. The reduction is a lot more than the cladding. But uh, if you run it 723 inch, if you had 723 and you do this type of configuration, your ID will be reduced to 495. And then here on the top, you can have that polished uh, larger bore on top. And then you can take that, which is the equivalent of 5.5. You can have 5.5 to surface, or you can inject or produce. If, if the rates are right uh, for you. So that's what I have. And uh, if you have any questions, we'll be at the end. Thank you so much, Pedro. Our no next talk is on well drilling uh, by Russell Bentley from Parsons Brinkerhoff. Good afternoon. Glad to see everybody's made it through it most of the week here. Uh, the crowd's thinning out just a little bit, but uh, really appreciate uh, Marie Therese and Steve from FEMSA for allowing me to come here today, and I really appreciate all your interest in the natural gas storage industry and all 
work together, if we can all work together to make this thing a success and, and safe for the general public, uh, uh, we'll be years ahead of uh, all our expectations. So uh, I'm uh, a petroleum engineer, drilling engineer, work for Parsons Brinkerhoff. Uh, we primarily are a civil engineering group, uh, been around since the late 1800s. <clears throat> best known, I guess, for uh, big buildings and uh, highways, uh, airports. We're remodeling some of LaGuardia Airport right now. Um, a company in uh, Canada, in Montreal, bought us a couple of years ago, WSP. And so now we've ended up with a tongue twister of a name called WSP Parsons Brinkerhoff. <laughs> um, and I'm sure we've got committees working on that right now to, for another name change coming on down the pike. but. Uh, in any event, uh, a lot of you in the gas storage industry probably know us a little bit better as uh, PB Energy Storage Services. And we've been around since the mid to late 1970s working on um, salt caverns and uh, leaching facilities and things like that. We work with a number of you uh, here in the audience we've talked with over the last few days. And uh, we were formed to <coughs> take advantage of or to uh, get into the uh, salt salt, uh, domal salt and interbedded salt business, primarily starting off with the uh, Strategic Petroleum Reserve in the Gulf Coast uh, in the, er the mid-70s. We built those facilities down there and have, have branched out from there and have worked on many salt cavern and uh, other storage facilities, including uh, natural gas storage, uh, and uh, also class one and class two injection wells, hazardous, non-hazardous. So. Anyway, there's about 180 of us uh, in the PV Energy Storage Group in uh, Houston and, and uh, Baton Rouge and uh, South Bend, Indiana, and uh, about 35,000 of WSP Parsons Breaker Hop around the world. So a little bit of an introduction about who we are. Um, I was originally scheduled to talk on uh, innovations in gas storage technology, uh, and I would emailed the topic of my talk in and uh, found out uh, just last Friday that uh, my talk was going to be on uh, well drilling. And so uh, I'm a very practical person, so let's, uh, let's talk about well drilling practices. Uh, you've seen probably a lot of these uh, uh, well bore diagrams and schematics uh, over the last couple of days, if you've been here for the last couple of days. I want to throw this one up here real quickly just to kind of get started with the discussion. Uh, I think you can probably see most of it, may, maybe not be able to read all the text on there, but uh, most wells, and this is a fairly simple one, we have a conductor casing uh, set or uh, augered in to place at maybe 40 to 100 feet or something like that. Uh, another uh, smaller uh, size casing, the surface casing going in below that to, uh, in this case, 500 feet, uh, another casing below that to an intermediate size casing, 5,100 feet. Finally, at TD, let's see, make sure I've got the, TD 11,000 feet, uh, uh, the final string of casing here in this case is 7 and 5 eighths. A um, couple of components I kind of wanted to point out to you here, and we'll talk about these real briefly. Um, We've got, the, we've got a packer in here, and this is a packer and a tubing uh, completion here. So all the, all the uh, well bore fluids are either withdrawn or uh, injected uh, through a tubing and packer. Uh, we've discussed uh, a number of wells, I don't know, maybe only 10% is what I'm hearing of the wells uh, uh, in the country that have this type of arrangement. So um, a lot of them don't have the tubing and packer in there. but. This particular example will we'll, we'll cover that. Another thing I want to point out here is the, uh, uh, the usable uh, drinking water level here uh, covered by, in this case, our intermediate casing. It's fairly deep in this case, 4,875 feet. Typically, it's a little bit more shallow, but one of the, one of the duties of the casing uh, is to uh, cover that uh, drinking water source. Um, so let's kind of move on into uh, to the next set of slides. I wanted to mention that integrity always comes first uh, on the header here, primarily because as drilling engineers, we want to make sure that the 
the casing all stays together, the well is fit for purpose, and the stakeholders involved with the, with the well, including the public, the regulators, uh, the company, the operator, can all have confidence that this well is, is holding up over time. I thought I was going to get through this without somebody stealing my thunder. I, uh, <laughs> I think yesterday it was uh, a guy with, uh, with uh, it was Jason, Jason Bach with Dominion had a fairly inclusive talk on drilling and well remediation practices and did a great job. And I mean, he really talked for 20 minutes about every possible topic you could think about for uh, well drilling and remediation. And I said, well, I can't do that. Uh, what I'd like to do, though, today is talk about a couple of items. And Pedro has actually already <coughs> talked about a couple of these, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip through them a little bit. I know everybody's, you know, getting a little tired here, but casing design, casing evaluation, cement types, and cement evaluation. And we're talking about general design issues casing integrity uh, and the cement going in behind it will go a long way towards making everybody feel safe that we've got at least uh, more than one uh, point of failure here. We've talked about that this week. Uh, in casing design, Pedro had mentioned this uh, a few points here. There's always the mechanical integrity of the well to keep in mind. Cost considerations. You know, there's all types of different uh, metallurgies that you can use in casing. Uh, I use, I often use a lot of uh, nickel alloy pipe in some of the injection and disposal wells that I work on. Extremely expensive, $200 a foot or more. So you can't use that kind of pipe all the way up. You have to use other types of pipe. And uh, so cost considerations are a big factor. Um, operating conditions obviously are a big factor in how you're designing the well, what's it used for. And uh, obviously another part of the design is to satisfy the regulatory requirements to make sure that the regulators are happy because they report back to their offices and they're the front line for the general public to make sure that uh, you know, things are operating safely. So number of, a number of things to keep in mind on casing design before we ever drill the well. Uh, casing evaluation, we'll touch on a couple of, a couple of issues there <laughs> that uh, have not been covered this week. And I just thought we'd talk, you know, essentially about new pipe. There's, there's things we can do to inspect new pipe and to even source new pipe. Um, a lot of these wells that uh, were drilled over the years, uh, I'm not sure exactly where all the pipe came from. Uh, probably a lot of it in U.S. sourced uh, casing. Um, but there's uh, certainly a number of uh, countries around the world now that are making great casing, uh, but not all countries. So. There's certain sources that we like to prefer to draw on uh, over others. <clears throat> Finally, we'll, we'll start to talk a little bit about cement types. We've covered some of that this week a little bit, but uh, I want to just kind of very, very high level talk about the various cement types that are out there and then just touch on some of the, some of the new technology that's out there with the epoxy resins. Um, and then the cement evaluation, once you get that cement in place, how to evaluate the job that you've just done put, to put the cement there. Uh, before we get going too far with those four topics, I want to uh, step back a little bit and talk a little bit more about just the casing design in general. Uh, one of the things that I've been talking about with, with Steve is, uh, and one of the things he mentioned the other day, with these safety factors and design factors involved with casing design uh, for drilling wells. Um, a design factor here, as you can see, is a, a number that we use to design the casing itself, uh, and it's the, essentially the casing rating uh, over the plan load, and there's a minimum of a design factor that all uh, drilling com companies or general contractors like uh, PV use to design their, their uh, casing strengths. These ratings are found in API bulletins, as you can see, and they help us uh, plan. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about uh, how these numbers are used. Essentially, uh, the design factor you just saw on the previous slide, but a safety factor then is the result of applying that design factor in the loaded, various loading calculations, and ultimately gives us a degree of confidence when those numbers are calculated 
that if you have a safety factor uh, that calculates greater than 1.0, you can feel very confident that it's fit for purpose and, and we have a, a good design of the, uh, of the casing string itself. There's a number of different things to, to think about uh, when uh, working out these uh, calculations on safety factors. The, certainly the casing setting depths are important. Um, the uh, fluid evacuation, buoyancy, all these, all these various uh, issues come into play when we begin as drilling engineers to design the casing itself and to uh, make sure it's uh, fit for purpose. Uh, Andy, I think, stole something from me. So this is unreadable, I know, um, but it wasn't really designed to be unreadable. Uh, what I did want to show was this is a form from a, a BLM uh, application, a drilling application that we sent in a number of years ago. And what it, what it shows here, I know it's hard to read, but I think you might be able to see it better when you get back to your office and, and pull up the uh, slideshow on the, on the internet there. But I have the different casing strings here. Uh, in this particular instance, it's 20 inch of a conductor pipe, 13 and 3 eighths uh, surface pipe, uh, 8 and 5 eighths intermediate, and a, a 5 and a half inch uh, production string. We don't typically do safety and uh, design factors on the conductor pipe because it's, uh, it's offset by three other strings of pipe and rarely comes into the equations here. So we typically concentrate on the surface casing, intermediate and production casing strings <clears throat> and do the analysis on whether or not we have good uh, safety factors coming out of this. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, the data that I just mentioned, or the, the uh, conditions with uh, heavyweight mud, lightweight cements, heavy cements, expected pressures, uh, uh, completion fluids, things like that, all go into these uh, calculations of a, of a safety factor. <clears throat> so I've got, I don't know if you can see it here, we've got uh, PV's design factors here for tension, uh, 1.8, collapse 1.125 and burst or, or 1.1. These are fairly common numbers throughout the industry. We may be a little bit more um, uh, heavy handed uh, with our approach than others. Um, most companies that do drilling and, and uh, uh, casing designs, things like that, have their own set of uh, design factors that they use, but these are the ones that we use at PB. Once you plug these numbers in and begin to, to calculate the actual safety factors, and in this particular example with the uh, BLM property that we drilled on, we ended up with safety factors here for tension well in excess of 1.0. Like for the 13 and 3 eighths, we had 7.88, uh, 8 and 5 eighths on the intermediate, 1.59, uh, 5 and a half uh, long string there, 1.28, well in excess of uh, 1.0. Pretty much the same for the collapse. Uh, we have uh, on the 8 and 5 eighths, we have the collapse of 1.09, so we're kind of getting down there close to 1.0. And then on the burst, it's 1.01. That's, that's pretty close, you know, so let's kind of let's zoom in on the burst on the intermediate here and you know, see what's going on on that a little bit. <clears throat> down in here, and again, one of the things that we do as we're going through these types of calculations is working out in our heads as engineers what are the maximum types of loadings that this casing's ever going to see. The intermediate, once the well is all put together, the intermediate casing's probably not going to get a whole lot of uh, exposure to uh, elements either inside the tubing, obviously two strings away from it, or within the casing uh, if, the, if you have tubing or if, if it's just casing, obviously, or a long string, it, the intermediate pipe won't see anything there either. But of course, what we're looking at here is when we're constructing the well and drilling the well. So we've got, oops, we've got to have a good uh, burst calculation on the intermediate, primarily as we drill out from that and drill down to TD. If we expect to t uh, see overpressured zones or take kicks in the well and work these things out, the intermediate casing could be exposed to higher pressures. So we have to make sure that all of our assumptions 
including some of the pressures, withstands <coughs> some of the uh, design criteria here. So in this case, uh, the burst on the intermediate was calculated using a, uh, a pore pressure equivalent to about 0.7 psi per foot, which is typical for the area that we're drilling in there. So if we took a kick and we couldn't contain it at the shoe with that 0.7 psi per foot, then we'd, we could burst the pipe out there. If it, if it reached that uh, fracture pressure at the shoe, then of course it would go out into the formation there. <clears throat> so it was one of the considerations we had to make when we were looking at the uh, intermediate casing design here. Uh, back to our, our burst calculations on the other two strings, we're well above 1.0, so uh, looks like we've got a pretty good design here. I wanted to touch on again, <coughs> excuse me, uh, again, the uh, new casing and tubing. Uh, we've worked with a lot of clients that have uh, approved vendor lists, AVLs, that uh, we have to uh, adhere to as a general contractor. They uh, want uh, only casing and, and tubing sourced from particular mills around the country, uh, certainly North America, U.S. Steel uh, uh, type of mills uh, are very good. Uh, Western Europe, uh, South Africa, Japan, South Korea, they all have a good pipe and good mills. Um, we always look to get the mill test reports, include those in our reports for our clients so they have good documentation. Um, and uh, usually with, with brand new pipe, it's already been uh, inspected and you've got the MTRs there, of course, as, as a good record of the, of the pipe quality itself. Once we get that pipe out to location, typically we'll uh, go ahead and clean and drift and, and do a visual inspection of the threads and make sure there's no ovality issues or anything like that, or the casing's been damaged and transportation out to location. On the other hand, you've got currently installed pipe, and uh, that's, that can be obviously a little bit trickier. We've heard a lot this week from various uh, service companies, Baker and Halliburton and others that uh, have talked about their uh, casing inspection logs, corrosion logs. I'm not going to really go into that all that much here. You guys have heard a lot about that already. Um, essentially, what they're used for is for the mechanical integrity tests and uh, uh, to, to measure uh, the, the integrity of the pipe. And if, the, if, the, over the, if it's been in the hole for a very long time, it's susceptible to erosion and corrosion and things like that. <clears throat> and so we run these well logs to determine the remaining thickness of that. And then if there happens to be anomalies there or uh, erosion, these corrosion problems are, are noted on the logs, we can go back in using some mathematical Barlow equations to uh, ascertain the new burst pressures and collapse pressures and things like that recalculate some of the safety factors and see if they meet minimum standards. So those are some of the things we get on the uh, currently installed pipe. So also if, if you have tubing in the hole, I wanted to mention that uh, it can be inspected obviously uh, right there on the spot and, uh, and then uh, actions, can, actions can be taken if necessary. I uh, wanted to put this uh, diagram up one more time here, and I wanted to, to just show real quickly that in this case, you know, we've got some c cement is not all the way up to the surface here. We've got the, the conductor pipe here has cemented surface, the surface pipe has cemented surface, the intermediate only comes up just into the surface casing there, and then you have free pipe all the way up, and, and again on the long string you've got this this void area here underneath the shoe of the uh, intermediate. So these are the types of things that we'll find in older wells sometimes after you've run a bond log, you don't have some of the records, you go out there and you discover these kind of anomalies. So these are the types of, of issues that we get into with, with casing, I mean with cement, um, and of course the cement there is used to form a bond between the casing and the borehole to seal everything up. Well, if cement's not there, then you don't have a seal and you could have some issues. Those are the issues that uh, I think we're going to all discover over the next, you know, seven to ten years as uh, one of the uh, 
as Andy had pointed out, that it's going to take to get in compliance with 1171. We'll be running bond logs. We're going to see areas here that need to be uh, fixed and remediated. We'll be uh, doing some squeeze work and, and bringing cement up the surface to uh, make things a lot safer. <clears throat> Generally, uh, and I think we've probably already covered some of this, Portland cements are the typical cement uh, used in the oil field industries nowadays. It's a blend of limestone and clay. Uh, API specifications uh, are out there uh, that have been talked about already. There's essentially 10, or I mean, eight classes of uh, cement, A through H. Uh, the general ones that we typically use in the industry are C, G, and H. Um, C being something that used a little bit more shallow depths uh, due to uh, uh, setup times are, are fast, the temperatures aren't quite as hot. Uh, G and H uh, have some different properties and um, can withstand higher downhole temperatures, but they take a little bit longer to set up. One thing that we've been uh, using lately, some uh, ran a job here recently with uh, Resin cement, uh, Halliburton makes a, a well lock resin um, that is uh, resistant to uh, carbonic acids and sulfuric acids in some corrosive environments uh, where we do work uh, oftentimes with our class one uh, wells and, and uh, some of our acid gas injection wells, things like that. Um, and uh, it, it's really an amazing cement. There's I think using it is going to become a lot more uh, common in the future. It uh, has incredibly high compressive strengths, uh, and it can be run with, in a very lightweight mode, down to seven pounds per gallon, thereabouts. And then you can add weighting agents uh, to modify it up to you know 14 pounds per gallon if you need to. But uh, we used it. Uh, on a job in West Texas recently, and we, uh, we brought it up about 2,500 feet, and uh, it was about nine pounds per gallon, uh, very similar to the mud weight that we had out there. Uh, we used an external casing packer on top of it to bring cement to surface, which was a Portland cement, um, but it, it performed really well, and it sealed up an injection interval that we uh, had out there, gave us great zonal isolation. Um, it's a pretty amazing product. <clears throat> also, I just wanted to mention, uh, you know, it's it's a it's a great product for uh, for uh, squeeze jobs, and because it's it's not as granular, it's more like a uh, kind of a like a syrup, and uh, you can you can squeeze it into incredibly small spaces. So it's great for squeeze jobs. I think it's going to be real interesting as the years roll forward and we see some of these various uh, cement bond logs come out. Uh, we'll be using some of these types of resins to, uh, to, to fix the wells at that point. Um, real quickly on cement evaluation tools, we've had several speakers over the last couple days and even today I think we talked about the, some of the bond logs a little bit. Um, acoustic bond logs, uh, the, the old CBLs of, of uh, yesteryear. Uh, have a three and five foot spacing on the uh, on the uh, acoustic uh, sond itself. Uh, you've, you're probably familiar with some of the typical uh, variable density log on the right here. Um, that and the, the amplitude measurements is essentially what you're getting. It's an omnidirectional type of tool. Uh, it's you know it's good. It's 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 what I've used and what I'm familiar with. Uh, you know, looking at uh, looking at bond logs. Um, Essentially, you're looking at a pipe that uh, is either free or it has cement around it. If it's free, it'll ring like a bell if you thump it. Uh, if it has a little bit of cement or it's touching something, it'll kind of thump a little bit with a much lower amplitude. So essentially, that's what we're looking at here with these types of logs is the amplitude trace uh, here uh, showing uh, very low amplitude. You see some of the, the uh, formation arrivals back in here on the VDL trace. The amplitude comes up here a little bit. You start to begin to see some of the casing, chevrons on the casing from uh, from the casing arrivals and things like that. And it's just a it's it's an older style of uh, cement bond log. <clears throat> the newer bond logs that are coming out, we talked about those a little bit. Uh, this particular one is a segmented bond log. I say radial. Uh, 
my good friend uh, Bob Welty with uh, Schlumberger can uh, talk to you uh, as long as you want about the difference between radial and segmented bond logs and, and uh, help you with your understanding of all kinds of things with uh, regards to bond logs. But uh, in any event, there's a lot of new bond logs coming out nowadays. Uh, these radial logs are good at looking around the pipe, giving us a lot more confidence that we have uh, a good bond all the way around the pipe and we're looking at actually different sections of the pipe. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, new uh, uh, I don't know, gadgets uh, <laughs> that the service companies are coming out with now to uh, increase our understanding of some of the, uh, the cement bonding uh, uh, situation that we have are, the, are flexural attenuation tools. And they're based essentially on the flexural attenuation or the uh, vibrating the excitation of the casing itself and reading that. Schlumberger does it uh, acoustically with a couple of uh, 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 tra transmitters there that, that spin on a little orb below their tool. Uh, it's looking at these, uh, the difference in uh, uh, impedance between the inner and outer walls of the casing here. So getting these two different traces here and, and comparing the contrast there, and it, it's, a, it's, an, it's a great indication of, uh, you know, whether the casing is bonded or whether you have a, I'm sorry, the, uh, the interface here between the mud and the inner casing and then the cement and the outer casing there. It's looking at that area very, very finely scoped in on that. <clears throat> uh, Baker has something kind of similar. Uh, they've got a pad contact tool that uh, uh, uses electromagnetism uh, to look at a similar type of excitation of the casing. And one of the advantages here is that it can be run uh, without fluids. I think uh, we talked about that uh, earlier, earlier today. I um, want to go ahead and try to wrap it up here. Again, uh, we're going through casing design. The uh, integrity starts with, with good casing design here. Uh, our design factors, risk factors need to be looked at. Um, we're going to be uh, looking at uh, casing evaluation uh, after the uh, casing is uh, put, in the, put in the ground. We have different types of cements. Older wells probably use mainly the traditional Portland cements. and. Um, then we're getting into some more exotic uh, epoxy resins too. So, um, the last thing I wanted to say, and uh, one of the speakers earlier uh, with the uh, blade energy had uh, actually discussed this. Ravi had said that uh, you know all the data involved in drilling a well is uh, is useful and is a core element of root cause analysis. And certainly they're looking at that at Aliso right now. All the all the data that they can get their hands on. Um, from uh, dr uh, drilling records, uh, workover reports, the original logs, things like that, all the permits, MITs. Keep those, uh, you know, we've talked to so many clients that have these in dusty old bins, you know, out in their uh, st uh, warehouses somewhere. And, but we've got, to, we've got to get those in, digitize them, take a look at them, have experienced engineers look through those records and begin the uh, process of uh, you know, analyzing and looking at uh, wellbore integrity and helping our clients feel good about their, their storage systems. Um, I'm real proud to be teaming with a partner, uh, RCP, uh, in uh, coming out with a product uh, later on this year. Uh, it's in beta testing now to, uh, to uh, look at uh, wellbore integrity. We call it SIMPLE. Uh, it's an acronym for uh, Storage Integrity Management Plan. Uh, there's a brochure outside, I urge you to pick one up and uh, talk to me afterwards or a couple of other of our uh, representatives here, but uh, we all want to work together and <clears throat> make this as safe industry as possible. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Russell. Thank you so much, Russell. Okay. Our next talk is going to be on risk assessment by V.J. Ragunatan.
Can you hear me okay? All right. All right. You can't? Is that all right? Better? Okay. Too much? Okay. Just checking if you're all awake. Okay. I know it's uh, 4 p.m. I don't know what's harder. It's uh, being the last presenter or the last but one. But uh, I know you have all been fantastic audience, and I uh, hope to uh, keep your attention by using some colors and GC graphics. So first of all, I would like to start by thanking Steve and uh, FEMSA for uh, this great opportunity to uh, be here. And I've learned a lot over the course of the day. Um, uh, uh, my name is uh, Vijay Raghunathan. Um, so I work with DNV, GL. You probably know more from DNV side. We do used to be a heritage company doing certification, ISO 14,000, 9,000, and all of that. And we do a lot of in the maritime industry as well. Uh, but I work for the oil and gas business here in Houston. Um, so uh, before I start, I would like to just uh, share a brief experience from last night. Um, I'm guessing most of you stay here in this hotel. Um, I stay in the uh, Omni Resort. And I don't know if you, have st if you stay there, you probably uh, had the pleasure of waking up somewhere between 1.30 and 2 last night as part of a fire alarm. Oh, you did uh, this one person. <laughs> So that was probably my first time not being in a drill, but in a real situation. So I, of course, I was working hard in this presentation till midnight, and after that I went to bed. And when you're trying to sleep really uh, deep sleep, you've woken up, I thought it was this uh, loud voice in my head, but then I woke up, it's lights, and I had, I had like 20 seconds to put on my safety hat, collect myself, I'm like, what am I going to grab, what do I, you, that's when you know it's real. I'm like, okay. So I tried to rush out of the door, put on some clothes, get out, and then I go down, and I'm like, OK, I forgot my keys. I forgot my glasses. And it's now, I'm not in Houston anymore. I need my jacket at 2 AM. Right? It's, it's, it, was, uh, it was an experience. And then I even, I'm not joking. I saw this person who had a glass of wine. I'm like, OK, he's, uh, he's really well prepared. Anyway, the message is, um, the message being, being a safety consultant, being a safety engineer, I, I think with a little more bit of planning, I think I could have been planned for the situation better. I mean, uh, putting my wallet on my glasses next to my bed uh, could have helped me collect those things quickly in time. Uh, if I'm at home, I know where things are. It's easier. But if I'm at a new place, and um, I know for future, that's a good thing. So yeah, it's kind of a safety moment I wanted to share a start with uh, before I get into. All right. Um, there's been some great presentations throughout the day. And I've heard the word risk assessment, risk management, preventive measures, mitigative measures. Uh, threats, hazards, consequences, fires, a lot of those things. And uh, all that is right up my alley. I, I mean, I work with them day in and day out. I've uh, been doing risk assessments for the last 12, 13 years now uh, for oil and gas, midstream, uh, downstream, pipelines, upstream, uh, some storage operators as well. So it was, I got really excited when I saw those words. And what I'll try to do now is I won't go into any of the technical details. By no means I'm a storage expert, though I've worked on some projects with and I've had the pleasure of uh, learning some stuff. But I'll focus more on the risk assessment side, what's best practice with the new regulations with 1170, 1171, and the white paper from Inga, and um, the Pipes Act and everything. So I know there's a lot of focus on how to do risk assessments. How can you apply risk assessments for uh, how can you get the best value out of them? So I'll be talking more around that. So uh, that's my brief agenda there. So there you go, my GC graphics. So well, first thing that comes to your mind when you think process safety. Now, we are talking about events like Aliso Canyon. Uh, there are, there's a difference in the industry, and I think there is a lot of misunderstanding when we talk about process safety. So I'm going to throw out some common scenarios for process safety in the gas storage uh, world. So something that comes to my mind is the first thing is, what are the hazards and threats at my facility? And then I could have, do I have enough safeguards to prevent a major accident like Alistair Canyon? Or if I'm doing a, say I'm pulling in, I'm doing a logging operation or a workover for an extended period of time, so I have to put a temporary trailer on site, where do I put the trailer on my site? So, so questions like this are, sounds very simple, but then when you, you have to think through it, if you're doing a hazard assessment, how do you do that? So if there is a fire, can I get my employees out on time? So that's another one. What is the risk of removing the SCSSVs from my wells? That's probably a very important question, and I saw that mentioned in a few times in today's uh, presentations, as well as in the PEMSA bulletin. That's one of the key things. You have to do a risk assessment to see if, if you need enough ESDVs or SCSSVs. So that's a critical point. Um, and then do I have an emergency response plan to respond to an uncontrollable release? 
So that could be medical emergency response plan, fire plans, like what uh, Chief Jones talked this morning. So all these things are typical process safety questions which apply to you as, as any other hydrocarbon facilities. Um, so before I go further into process safety, this is what I wanted to clarify. There is, there is a misunderstanding in the industry, and it's not easy as well, between occupational safety and process safety. A lot of times it gets used interchangeably, and it gets measured interchangeably. So that's, so when, in, in the last 30 years, the oil and gas industry has seen a significant improvement in occupational safety. So as you can see, there is at least uh, 10 times um, a decrease in, um, uh, or more than that, in occupational safety related incidents. But then when you look at, when I say occupational safety, I mean slips, trips, and falls, those kind of events. And then when you look at the process safety incidents, uh, this has been taken out from the Marsh, Marsh reports. Uh, they report total insurable losses every year. Um, every year. And uh, for the last five years, if you look at the major, major um, accidents or major uh, accident hazards, they are kind of not gone down. There is no trend which shows that it's gone down significantly. And that's worrying, and, and that's uh, also why we are here. We've seen Also Canyon, we've seen Macondo, we've seen Texas City. So there, is, there are a lot of those and a lot of near misses that go unreported. So process safety is clearly something that we can still have a lot of opportunity to improve. And so that's what I wanted to clarify before I go into more details. Motivation for all of this, the risk assessment that we're talking about, I don't want to go into details. Um, you, we've been talking about that. A lot of people have said uh, a lot of things about it since morning, so I won't bore you with that. But quickly to say, regulatory, public, uh, those two things are quite important. Public, uh, there's more public concern. Clearly, the regulations are now changing or evolving. And then every company has prudent operators. They have their own corporate EHS objectives. And then uh, business performance. I, I mean, I've been doing this for quite a long time, and every time I talk to clients, it's, it's, I know it's hard to put, convert, or translate safety into dollars, but then in the long run, safety, a safe run business is definitely, it en enhances your business performance in the long run. And a lot of people don't realize it, but uh, it certainly does. If you talk to successful operators, successful people, they, they, they'll tell you it's, uh, it actually is very strong uh, relation, uh, correlation between those two. And then industry best practice. Of course, if you're a prudent operator, you want to be on top of things. You want to say, I'm, I'm, I have a really good safety record. And so being on top of that is industry best practice. These are some of the motivations that tells you why you want to do risk management or why you want to do a risk assessment. So managing process safety. Uh, now, there are a lot of guidance materials. Uh, CCPS has a great book on process safety. And OSHA PSM has their 14 elements, and then there are quite a few like that. Uh, the four major pillars that I, when I think about process safety are committing to safety. So you as a company, you commit to safety, and then you understand your hazards and risks. That's very important. And then you manage risk. You do something about it. And then you learn from experience. This is kind of broadly covers process safety. I mean, if you, you can fit all the 14 elements of the OSHA PSM within this, or any other safety management system mostly can be fit into this. Then you have human factors, you have other things, but uh, you have audits, but mostly it's, it can be fit broadly into these four categories. Um, the other thing, the trend in process safety enhancement I wanted to share was, so there has been safety management systems over the last 20 years, it's been safety management systems, then came risk assessments, then came behavior management, more safety culture related stuff. And then there is more newer stuff, which is barrier management. And the first few things helped improve occupational safety significantly. And with respect to operational safety or process operational safety, the barrier management or bow tie approach, which I'll be talking to you in a few minutes, is, is actually really helping a lot of people. And a lot of companies have successfully used it to look at their processes, their humans, uh, their, their people, and the systems as barriers or safeguards and for preventing a threat manifesting itself into a nasty incident. So what I'm going to do next is I, I'm going to talk about, um, today I'm not going to go into all the details. There are several ways to do risk assessments. So I'm going to talk about one quantitative approach and another more qualitative approach for operational risk assessments. Um, so step one, when you're doing a risk assessment, and I've, I've looked at the PEMSA document and all the, uh, the presentations this morning as to 
what goes into a risk assessment and in line with that, that's, that's what, what's written there is what they're proposing in 1171 and 1170 are very much really good industry standard best practices. They want you to be in line with that. And it's also performance based as uh, I think Andy mentioned that performance based. It has to be performance based rather than just purely prescriptive. So th those are really good approaches to start with. And so I'm gonna talk about two. One, the first one will be a quantitative risk assessment. And next, I'll move to a more uh, qualitative approach. So the reasons for doing that, you uh, want to make sure that people on site are safe. You want to make sure public is safe. You want to protect your assets. You want to protect your business. So there are, you want to protect the environment. So there are several motivations to do a risk assessment. And sometimes you want to quantify things to know how safe am I, how safe is safe, and how safe am I with compared to others? How safe am I compared? Is the risk at my facility tolerable or acceptable? Um, so as part of a typical quantitative risk assessment, you do, a, you do data gathering, you go into a site, you, take, you, do, you do site visits, you collect information, you do what you call hazard identification. I'm sure a lot of you already do that. So you, do, you identify your top hazards your, or threats, and then you identify your safeguards, your current safeguards, and you do all that, you collect that. And the next thing, then you can do more uh, detailed consequence modeling, which is, okay, if, there, if I have a loss of containment, then what is my extent of gas dispersion? What's my extent of fire, explosion, and environmental damage? And there are good models available out there. So um, I mean, DNVGL has used one called FAST, which has been there for 25 years. So we use that to model and tell you what is the distance for the fire, your gas dispersion, your explosion overpressures, those kinds of things. And then you take that, and then you multiply that with the likelihood of the event happening. So that's a risk assessment. A risk is basically a product of your likelihood and, and your consequence. So, the, and a lot of that is, I mean, it sound, I made it sound very simple, but of course it's, it has, it takes into account event trees, like directional probability of the wind and a lot of other things. So then you come up with your risk estimate for your site. So it could be your well site, it could be your compression, compressor station. So it could be any of those. And you take into account the number of people working there and all of that, and you come up with a risk number. So one way of using this could be to assess if the risk at your site is tolerable or not. Unfortunately, in the US, you don't have a, a criteria per se, but then there are various good industry standard criteria available to say, am I good with respect to industry standard, with respect to my criteria? And, and the figures you see there are typically how it looks, like they call them individual risk contours, saying what is my hypothetical uh, risk to an individual, whether it's one in a million or one in 10,000 or one in a thousand, things like that. And I know for LNG facilities, NFPA 59A now gives a risk-based approach as one of the options, and they have a criteria there. But other than that, you, it's hard to find criteria in the US which is published. But as I said, you can use industry standard, and um, you know, I worked with US operators who agreed to use standard criteria. So you do that first, and you say, okay, am I in the intolerable range? If I'm in the intolerable range, then you ne definitely need to do something about it. At that point, you don't, I mean, you really know you're not in a, uh, it's in a safe zone, so you do something about the risk, and then you say, okay, let me go ahead, identify my major risk contributors, and then you do some risk mitigation around that. Now, as I said, for application, this can be applied for compliance. It can be applied for estimating public risk and communicating the risk to the public, or facility siting, as they call it, in the process safety world. It's, that's exactly to say, if I'm going to have a extended work or uh, activity, so where do I put my trailer, are my occupied buildings, are they safe? Can they take the fire or the overpressure? Those kinds of things. So you do an assessment to say, are, are people safe? Do I have enough ventilation? Do I have those kinds of things? And benchmarking of facilities. So you have multiple storage sites, then you can benchmark them to say, where do I prioritize my risk mitigation plan first? Which is more riskier compared to the other? One could be closer to population where this other one could be in a remote area. And then you can use it for uh, ALARP is as slow as reasonably practicable, practicable decisions, which is you've now come out of your intolerable zone, you're more in the zone where you want to get into continuous risk reduction, you want to demonstrate you're prudent in managing your risk to the regulator, to the public, and then so, and you can always say, I'm spending a lot of money in maintenance of my SCSSV, so do I really need it? Is it absolutely essential? Then a risk assessment can tell you, can feed into your cost-benefit analysis and say, uh, whether it's necessary or not. And that's actually, it's one of the approaches in, in the PEMSA bulletin I read that they encourage you, encourage you to use risk assessment for making that decision. So 
this is some of the ways that you can use a quantitative risk assessment. Right? So you've done this. This is great. You know what risks are. You're, you're, you have a number. You can work with that. Uh, but again, this thing is probably not the best tool when you start looking at day-to-day -day operations. So what would be really good is what I'm going to show you next is what we call the, the barrier-based risk assessment approach using bow ties. So that's a typical bow tie. And this approach has been there for, again, 20, 25 years. I know Shell uses it big time, and a lot of other operators also use it. Um, so a bow tie, if I typically, I mean, uh, what I've shown here, I'll try to explain it in a very, very simple um, uh, real-life example, or not real life, but day-to-day -day example. It's more common. Uh, if you think of the hazardous event as a, a car crash, since I come from Houston, I talk a lot about cars. Uh, so uh, a car crash, and then there could be a lot of threats that could lead to a car crash. Say one could be um, a car a skidding of the car itself. So for if I have to, if I think of a car skid as a threat, uh, which could result in a car crash, there could be numerous safeguards or barriers, as I call it, uh, that could be put in place for that preventing that from happening. So it could be your uh, ABS system, it could be good tires, you maintain your tires, could be good roads, things like that. So that prevent the crash from happening. Then on the right side of the bow tie is where we have your mitigating barriers, so or mitigating safeguards, and that could be emergency response, and uh, if you're in a crash, you have good airbags, I mean, it protects you, things like that. So the same thing could be applied in, your, in a gas storage concept, and this really helps because it You've done numerous hazard assessments. You, uh, you've done all of that. It's all in paper, but there's so many details there. People can get lost in details, and you don't know where to prioritize. So if I pick top three major accident events for my facility, for my gas storage facility, and if I put it in this form and say, I've identified all my threats, I know all my safeguards, which could be human safe. It could be these barriers could be physical barriers. It could be processes, it could be procedures, or human factors. And I know that I have these barriers in place that will prevent my event from happening. And it still happens beyond all that. Then do I have enough mitigating barriers for, make, for mitigating the consequence? It could be instead of a fire, I could just escape with just a release. So things like that. So let me, I, I tried to recreate this in the gas storage concepts of, uh, if I've said something incorrect there, uh, uh, um, pardon me, but so for a well integrity, I used the, I took some examples from the 1171, and I said for a well in integrity, I mean, we're looking, uh, looking at the top event of loss of containment and only showing you the left side of the bow tie here, which is the preventive barriers. And so well integrity could be one of the threats, and I could have different uh, safeguards in place. It could be your inspection and maintenance program. It could be your corrosion protection program. Uh, it could be your monitoring programs where you monitor the pressure and the volume and the rate. It could be your SCSSV that could prevent that from happening. So these are, could be your different barriers. And if I want to take one step further, I can say, what are the effectiveness of my barriers? Are, I know I have all these barriers, but I do I really know if they are in top shape. If I, so as you see there, I put some color coding there. It's all in green, which means in the, for, for the first threat, all of them are in green. So you set some performance standards. I'm sure you already have asset integrity programs, you set performance standards to say, I need my SCSSV performing at this level. So you can say, once in a while, you revisit this and you say whether it's green, it's yellow, or it's red. So that's one way of keeping track of it. So for my second one, I have a well intervention equipment failure. And as I said, there you could have more procedural barriers, trainings and training and procedures, or it could be contractor selection. Uh, again, SCSSV could also be a barrier there that could prevent a loss of containment from happening. So you can identify this, and most of this you would have already done. You would have done through numerous hazard sessions or HAZOP sessions. So all it takes is just taking that and putting in them in a bow tie form. And it makes it a much more, much powerful risk communication tool when you look at it. So you can have maybe three or four bow ties for a facility. That's all you need. And you'll see a lot of redundant barriers. And I'll, I'll come to the applications of this in a minute as well. So on the right side, now you said the event has happened. I could have all these things. My consequences could be environmental damage, or it could be fire and explosion. So if it's environmental damage, then okay, I can, you can have your BOP or lubricator system. You can have a relief well plan, drilling plan. 
or you can have a good spill response plan. So in this case, I said, OK, we don't know what the spill response plan is or how it is, the condition of it. But my BOP and relief valve plan are quite good. So I have two, at least two barriers in place that will prevent a major environmental damage. And for fire and explosion, you have ignition control. You have fire suppression systems, maybe automatic or maybe not, and open facility layout, which prevents congestion and explosion from happening. Now, you've done your risk assessments. So your risk assessments already tell you what your safety critical elements are. I think Chief uh, Jones this morning talked about safety critical elements. You can think of these barriers as your safety critical elements. And your QRA can tell you which ones are safety critical, which means which ones help reduce my risk or mitigate my risk to the maximum. So by, after that, you know which ones are your safety critical, and you can invest more resources and time on, on those barriers. And I, I, as I said, uh, there are a lot of real good benefits. We've used this for a lot of companies as an operational risk tool. It's more visual. So starting from the operator all the way to the board of directors, if you want to say, if they say, can you prevent something like Aliso Canyon from happening? Do you, do you know if you have enough safeguards in place? You can walk in with three bow ties and say, we think we, we, these are our threats. This is our barriers. And we know the status of our barriers. And each barrier can be owned by a person. It could be by a person. It could be by a department. So it becomes really, uh, there's a lot of accountability. And it's, there's a lot of transparency as well. Uh, as I said, human factors could be incorporated in, into this whole process with so much ease. That could be a barrier. And if for some reason, I know that most sites probably not PSM compliant with OSHA PSM, but you have some kind of safety management system. So you probably have MOCs in place. You do PSSRs or job safety analysis. But if you think about this, every time you do something an MOC, you can pick up the bow tie and say, will, which, will this in introduce a new threat? Or do I have, will, by doing this MOC, will I switch off any of my safeguards? So it becomes quite an easy tool to use instead of going through detailed risk assessment reports. Uh, you can use it in incident investigation. So if you have a near miss and if, I, if you decide to do an incident investigation, again, you can use this bow tie to do an incident a root cause analysis to say which of my barriers failed or what are the escalation factors that cause my barriers to fail. It's a great training tool. It's great for training people across the organization. And I think the last one, it, it's been, it can also be used as a good auditing or a budgeting tool. So as I said, if you're planning for the next years or future years, uh, you know your risks. You probably have been spending a lot of money on some of the safeguards in a structured way. But then if you want to think of it in a risk-based approach, you can say, OK, I know these are my risks. And maybe I've been spending too much on these barriers. But, or maybe I have redundant barriers. I don't really need this much. So for subsequent years, I can remove a barrier or safeguard. You, it's not always about introducing new barriers. It's about you can work efficiently. So for all those things and, and much more, I think uh, the barrier-based bow ties are becoming more and more common. It's, it's, as I said, it's already been used extensively. Um, we, we've helped Bessie after Macondo. We worked a lot with Bessie. Uh, we've been training them in using bow ties. Um, we've been training a lot of pipeline operators with bow ties. And uh, DNV is writing a book for CCPS on bow tie barrier-based uh, risk management, which should come out shortly, I think. So it's, it's a, we think it's a very good approach. So quick uh, concluding remarks. Um, as I, I think this was already mentioned in the, this earlier today. But we, be, we also believe that performance-based risk management, along with prescriptive measures, is, is a very powerful tool, especially given the changing regulatory regime, challenging financial market, operational complexities, aging assets. I think that was mentioned as well and increased contractor participation. So we, that's also becoming more and more common. And it's becoming harder just to use prescriptive rules and solve this process safety challenges. And as I said, QRA uh, has its own place. It's very good for understanding impact to people, assets, and environment. And the barrier-based approach is excellent to manage operational risks on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's more like a, a living document, living tool, rather than a static document. So um, that's it. Yeah. Thanks so much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you so much, EJ, for a very engaging presentation. Our next talk is on States First.
by Richard Simmers, Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Good afternoon. I have the enviable task of being the last speaker for the day. Uh, the crowd that's here has thinned out considerably, but I want to thank you for your diligence in hanging in there. Um, for those of you that may be uh, continuing on with the webinar, again, thank you for hanging in there. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly so we have a little bit of time at the end and I don't keep you around too long, but I hope to have enough time at the end that you can ask any of these speakers questions. Now, my name is Rick Simmers. I'm the chief of Ohio's oil and gas regulatory program. I'm a co-chair of the state's first initiative. The other co-chair is Hal Fitch. Hal's my counterpart in Michigan. He heads uh, Michigan's oil and gas and mining program. Many of you may not be familiar with states first. What states first is, is a collaboration of state regulators. State regular, regulators like Hal and I, uh, talk to each other pretty regularly throughout the course of a year. We also have forums where we meet and we talk about uh, topics of interest or concern. Some of those forums are uh, the annual meetings or the mid-year meetings that are associated with the Groundwater Protection Council or the Interstate uh, Oil and Gas Compact Commission. With those two organizations, as the state regulators go to those forums, we had the idea that we should approach these two organizations and say that sometimes there are topics or issues that are of great, of great enough importance to the, us, the state regulators, that we need help in addressing those issues. So we went to these two organizations and said, can you help us form a coalition of state regulators so that when we identify what we think is a very important issue, you can help us address that issue. So they, they both agreed to do that, and the state's first initiative was created. An example of a state's first initiative is a, a primer that we created last year, and we released this in late September of uh, 15. It's a primer on induced seismicity. Now, it addresses induced seismicity that might be associated with the process of injection. It also includes some discussion about induced seismicity that may be associated with uh, oil or gas wells with exploration, exploration and production. Um, I encourage you to go look at this primer. If you look at this, you're going to have an idea of the type primer or advisory document that we will create for the storage industry as well. This document can be found uh, at statesfirstinitiative.org or on the IOGCC or GWPC websites. Now, why did we come to the conclusion that we need to address gas storage? You're going to see a photograph that you've seen probably time and time again. This is courtesy of EDF. This is a thermal image of natural gas. Uh, largely, when you look at this kind of natural gas as it's being released into the atmosphere, you can't see it with your eye, but through thermal imagery, it becomes very apparent that it's being released into the atmosphere. Um, anybody that looks at this type of problem should say something needs to be done. Regulators at a state and a federal level need to step back and identify what's wrong with regulation. So the state's first initiative went to the two organizations, GWPC and IOGCC, IOGCC and said we need to address this. We need to create a primer or an advisory document to help federal agencies and state regulatory agencies step back, critically review federal code, state statutes and state rules and identify what's wrong. And uh, sometimes it's not what's wrong, it's what's missing. There are gaps in federal code and there can be gaps in state code as well. This is a map that many of you may have seen. It's an EIA map that shows the relative location of gas storage fields across the country. Now the one thing I do want to note, this map doesn't include excavated mines that are used for the storage of liquefied gases such as propane. There are about 80 of those that could be added to this map. This map does address those natural gas facilities throughout the country. Now an interesting thing that you might note about this map is there seem to be groupings of gas storage across the country. Now there are reasons for this. Um, 
One of the reasons is that the depleted oil and gas fields was found many decades ago could be recharged by injecting natural gas back into them and then storing that gas in that depleted reservoir until it was needed. The groupings are because uh, historic development in the uh, Midwest type area of the United States, in the southern portion of the United States, and in western United States, had many of these type of facilities where gas could be stored. You may not know, but Michigan has the greatest storage p potential in the country. That's followed by Texas. Now, if you take Texas's total storage as 100%, Michigan has about 135% total storage compared to Texas. So Michigan is by far the state that has the most potential to store natural gas. Texas is followed by Pennsylvania as the third largest capacity for storage. And then those are followed by Louisiana, California, Illinois, Ohio, and West Virginia. So you see these groupings. You see the grouping around the Great Lakes in the Appalachian area and the Great Lakes. That's associated with the old oil and gas development that occurred. You see it in the southwest or south central United States again, associated with development and where those resources are. And California is kind of out there by themselves. They have a lot of storage potential. But you'll notice areas that don't have much storage. The Rocky Mountain area, very little storage in the Rocky Mountain region. Um, the North Central United States, not much storage in that area, in that area either. One area that's obviously devoid of storage is the whole east coast of the United States. Is this map going to change over time? If you look at this map maybe next year or over the next couple of years, some of these facilities might close, but more likely there are going to be more facilities on there, this map than there are today. You have to ask yourself why. Um, natural gas used to be a seasonal fuel. It was mainly used for heating, so during the winter months it was used. When it wasn't used in as large a quantities as it's currently used, pipelines often were able to keep up with that supply. But as the, the product was used more and more, pipelines alone could not keep up with storage and the production out of a well could not necessarily keep up with storage. So gas had to be taken out of storage, put into the pipeline so that the demand could be met. Um, gas is not a seasonal fuel anymore. It's becoming more and more a fuel that's used year round. In my home state of Ohio, there are seven electric plants that are going to be gas-fired that are under construction. One has been built, four are currently under construction, and two are being uh, planned for later this year. Now, to show you the relative um, importance of that, those seven gas-fired electric plants will create enough electric at peak to be able to power uh, 5.85 million households. 5.85 million households. Now, Ohio has a population of about 11.5 million and estimated 4 million households. So those seven plants could generate more electric than the households of Ohio would need. That's becoming a fuel for electric generation. It's becoming a fuel that's used commonly. Uh, many of the, the electric plants are switching over to that because natural gas is readily available. It's relatively inexpensive, and through pipelines and storage, supplies can be assured. So this map will change over time. That's very important for us to remember. The state's first initiative has uh, initiated our charter to come up with a primer or an advisory document for the regulatory programs. As we developed this initiative and we started seeking volunteers to work on this, we uh, began to make an outline. With the topic of gas storage, if you were part of the DOE conversations over the past two days, you heard many, many conversations that talked about um, risk management, mitigation, well construction, reconstruction of wells. You heard many of those talks today. What do they mean? Well, you have to step back and critically review all the many parts of gas storage. Break them down into their component parts break the component parts down into smaller parts, and then address them. This document is meant to address those many parts of gas storage and then provide advice to regulatory programs on how to manage that program. 
I want to tell you what States First is not. These are not um, draft rules. They aren't model regulations where state regulars or regulators are getting together and saying each state you ought to do these things. What it is, is it identifies issues associated with the topic of gas storage and then provides advice for regulators to consider as they develop statutes or rules. We've broken this down into four major areas. You see about 13 items on this, this one slide, but there are literally over 100 and those will be broken down into many dozens more topics. But we've broken this down into four main areas. One of the first areas is permitting. Uh, permitting is analogous to uh, creating a blueprint for a house. In a blueprint, you, you add in there what you would like to see in your house, and you also add in there what's required by code. Building codes all around the country say you have to have certain things in your house. You have to construct it a certain way. Permitting for gas storage is no different. It's the design where the company says, these are the things I would like in the well. And then it's also the regulatory side where the regula regulator says you have to have these things in it as well. If you don't do this part right, right off the, off the go, you're going to have problems. So this is critically important to get permitting right. Now permitting is far more than just the simple act of permitting. This group's led by some state regulators. You heard one of them this morning, Ryan Hoffman from Kansas. Michael Sims from the Texas Railroad Commission is also chairing that particular portion of this group. Another portion of this breakdown would be construction. Now you can take that house blueprint and you hire somebody to build that house for you. If you don't build the right, or if you don't hire the right builder, you're going to have problems with your house. Gas storage companies have to do the same thing. When they get that permit, which is equivalent to a blueprint, they have to decide who's going to drill and construct that well for them. And while they're drilling and constructing, it has to be tested. Testing's integrity. Um, just like a building inspector would go make sure your house has been built properly, regulators go make sure that the wells that are constructed are built properly. This group's being led by Virginia Hullinger. Uh, she's from Oklahoma, and, and with her is Tim Baker, who's, who's also a regulator within Oklahoma. Operations. Um, you know, like your house, you designed it, you build it, now you live in it. Uh, an analogy would be an operator now operates the storage wells that they had designed and built. These wells can last for a long time, um, so it's very critical that over the operational life of a well, they be maintained similar to your house. If you don't maintain certain things in your house, it's going to cause problems. These wells are no different. You have to maintain things on them. You have to evaluate them. You have to decide where you're going to put your money, where you're going to put your time. So the operational life of a well is extremely critical. Um, you've all heard from Alan Walker. Alan Walker from Cal California is going to be addressing this portion of the state's first initiative. The last portion, major portion of this initiative is that of closure. You know, we like to think that when we build a house it's going to last forever, but the reality is they don't. At some point, they get torn down. At some point, gas storage wells need to be plugged. Um, critical decision at some point has to be made, and an operator has to make a decision or be ordered to make a decision uh, to plug a well. Plugging a well may seem like a simple thing, but it's your last chance to uh, properly cause this thing to go away and not have it come back and cause problems later. Really important that this be done properly. Diana Byrne from Colorado is leading that group. One of the things that is a component part of all of these areas and the many dozens that aren't listed here is that of communication. You heard the fire chief talk this morning, and uh, as I was listening to his presentation, I thought communications could have been get, uh, a lot better in the Lesso Canyon um, event. Communications real important from the time you permit a well, you're deciding on the permit, you're working through it. There has to be a lot of communication with many different parties as well as being permitted. It's got to be a whole lot of communication as it's being built and tested. 
And then through the operational life, which could be many decades, there's got to be a lot of communication. And then with closure. But in between, uh, we have to all realize that there could be a problem. Alyssa Canyon uh, emphasizes that. So with that communication, you need to have risk management. You need to take emergency management considerations into account. But you need to do this stuff ahead of time, not once something occurs. You heard VJ. I was in the Omni, too. I, I had that alarm wake me up at 2 o'clock. Uh, VJ, I, I, too, was trying to think, what do I need to take outside? How long am I going to be outside? Do I need to take my wallet and room key and stuff? So I was trying to plan real quickly. Now, planning ahead of an emergency is a whole lot better than planning as you're in the emergency. If you plan in the emergency, you're going to miss a whole bunch. We all know that. It's very important that planning in the form of communication occur through every phase of this. Now, the communication component of this is far-reaching. There shouldn't just be communication between the regulate, regulated industry and the regulator. It should be broadly applied. In my home state, again, we have an emergency program where we uh, have created emergency response programs. We work very closely with local emergency responders and responders at the state and federal level. We go through a whole bunch of planning. We have mock exercises frequently. And we try to be as prepared as possible should an emergency ever occur. It's very, very important that that be an integral part of this advisory document to regulators. What I want to leave you with is the state's first initiative is a little bit different than the other initiatives that you've heard today and in the previous two days. PHMSA has a work group, and it's a very good work group. They're working with many partners to come up with a process to create rules for gas storage. Some of the uh, trade organizations have created work groups, and they've come up with very good technical documents to help with this. States First differs from those in that the state regulator regulatory agencies have gotten together, and we said we need to step back, we need to critically review our regulations, and we should ask for help in that review. So we're asking for help in a broader way than the other groups that are going through these kind of reviews are doing. We're reaching out to anybody that wants to have meaningful input in an advisory document to regulators. In the seismic document, we had the state regulatory body involved. We had many federal agencies involved. We had a number of universities, research institutes, um, the regulated industry, and many others, including NGOs, that participated in that final document. And again, I encourage you to look at it because it's a very good advisory document. So what I'm extending to you is a formal invitation. And Zach, this is extended to PHMSA, the Department of Energy, US EPA, and other federal agencies to join the state's first initiative so that we all put our collective knowledge together and work on this problem. But I want to also extend to anybody, whether you're at a university, whether you represent a company, a service company, an NGO, academia, whoever, if you can contribute to meaningful dialogue that's going to be put in an advisory document to regulatory programs, I encourage you to contact Amy Childers. Amy will put you in touch with those group leaders, and you can help write this document. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you so much, Richard. Uh, now it's time for questions. Uh, I have a question here for Pedro that I'm going to give you. And then we have a quick, quick question here from the web as well, which I'm going to start and answer first. Um, so uh, John W. Dennis, PhD, uh, states, uh, it is my understanding that many, if not all, of the EU c countries now require subsurface safety valves on all underground gas storage well tubing. For what reason is the U.S. Uh, 
in, in, in industry still refusing to implement this extra cost to ensure better safety in view of three catastrophic failures seen in the past 15 years? Why is gas flow through casing still being considered acceptable, uh, given the un understanding that this is risky use of the annular space in the ca casing that resulted in the Aliso Canyon accident? Um, I'll, I'll try to answer that. I'd like to thank him for his comments. Uh, a few of the presenters uh, stated that regulations are often reactive, you know, and federal and state governments are taking actions to try to prevent another incident like Aliso Canyon from happening again. Uh, you know, today's workshop we discussed how complicated uh, the regulatory landscape is, you know, how many agencies are involved, and also the industry standards uh, that are being de developed to address this. You know, and subsurface safety valves, you know, uh, have been discussed by many presenters, uh, including Baker Hughes, uh, Inga, and others. And the flow-through casing is also, you know, being addressed by California Dogger and their regulations there. Uh, so, you know, we are working on many of these issues, you know, in, including this. And, um, and, you know, and please realize it's a long, complicated process, you know, to develop new regulations for the industry, you know. And we appreciate you know, your comments. Yes, please. I'd just like to add, uh, this is a good question. Um, especially, I think I saw this in the ANGA presentation about having the subsurface safety valves. Uh, I mean, if we, it's, though, I mean, if it can be made mandatory, but you also need to consider the risk or downside of having a uh, valve. If there is going to be a lot of well entries, then if you're going to bring a lot of people on site, then you actually increase the risk in some cases. So sometimes it's good or prudent to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, so that's where a risk assessment could help. Hello. Okay, so the question is, uh, with the three types of remedial liners discussed, what impact do they have on running high-resolution casing inspe inspection logs? Okay, considering the three types, the, the first type, well, in, in all of them, but um, I'm, I'm going to address uh, one by one. The, um, the, the question is from Andy Horton. Um, the cladding is going to have uh, contact, direct contact. It's expandable, a solid expandable, which is going to be in direct contact with the exi existing casing. So um, we would have to look and talk, talk to, uh, I'll get with, um, I have it in my notes, I'll follow up with uh, uh, our logging team to see if they have done any, any logging in this type of well before. Because you, you're going to have distinctive, you have, you're going to have a clad, which is in contact with the casing. So it, it's going to depend on the, the depth of, um, the depth of investigation that the tools have. That is in direct contact. If you have elastomers, then you're going to have uh, the expandable clad, you're going to have elastomer, and then you're going to, you're going to have the casing. Uh, for the other other options, you're going to have a standoff, and then if you run it in the hole and you cement it, it's it's my understanding that that you will be logging the new the, the new liner that, that you have installed, and you're going to be getting the resolution on the uh, cement that's behind that you have placed behind that uh, that new liner. I don't know if if, if the if the investigation depth of the tool will give you visibility, or if, if you require that visibility, if you have, out, have already uh, isolated that well uh, and, and remediated. Um, and the third one, if, if, you, if you use it just as a straddle and you don't cement it, again, you would, you, you would get the, uh, the inspection of, of that liner that you have installed, and then you had a void space it's going to be fill, uh, filled with fluid and then the other casing, which, again, if you have isolated and you possibly test it, 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 would, um, it would be uh, removed from the equation. So, um, Andy, if you, if you give me your email or I, I can follow up with, I'll, I'll do the, the inquiry if, we, if we've done some double 
double casing inspections, and then I, I, I can give that feedback. But in general terms, that, that's what it is. You're, you're relining the well. So, so practic practical terms, you, you're turning a, a used well into a new well, a new casing. Okay? Okay, great. Thank you. Pedro. Any other questions from the audience? If not, uh, Alan has some closing remarks. Okay, thanks, Ken, and um, I'll keep this brief because I know we're up uh, at the top of the hour, 5 p.m. That's a magic time for, for many people, and I think many of you have flights, but uh, just to really recap and maybe amplify some of the topics were discussed here. Um, you know, in the morning session, certainly we, we had a, a good uh, discussion on the incident itself in Aliso Canyon, and, uh, you know, it was good to hear firsthand an account of, of the um, response, the, the lessons learned, and the recommendations, potential recommendations going forward. I think, you know, the theme there, if I had to put it uh, in, a, in a couple of uh, words, uh, like communications, I think we've heard that even, you know, in the afternoon. Communications is key. You know, who do you talk with? What do you do in the aftermath of these incidents? I think there was a lot learned related to that. I think as we look to develop policy, we can uh, look to, uh, that will be a focus area. Um, and, and I might add, too, it's already really a, a requirement in our code for uh, Part 192 with pipelines um, related to emergency response plans um, and public awareness, and that needs to be a focus area. Underground storage will not be, you know, any different, but we will learn from this incident and apply those learnings as we, um, you know, look where we need to go next. Emergency response management, certainly that was key, and that's uh, you know, something we, we, we work with on incidents that happen in, in, around the country, and, um, you know, we, we do learn from those. Certainly with the Liso Canyon, we learned that, you know, this incident really, you know, really ballooned into something quite, quite large, um, very unique, and that, uh, you know, maybe a, a better way or a more effective way to manage um, the response um, as, as we move forward there. You know, especially with, on the operator side, you know, as far as the, the issue of potentially conducting drills, which really uh, should be already done and is done uh, for pipelines, but that should be done uh, really in advance. I think the point has been made a couple of times, in advance of instance, um, and then to understand the effect of these facilities on the local public and, you know, gauge your response to what that impact could potentially be. Again, the importance of emergency uh, plans, just working with the local community in particular. I think that was just a, a huge glaring area that, that we need to focus on. The technical part, which the afternoon covered, well, I think is important, and certainly there, there are some things we need to do and, and we'll do in that area, but certainly the human side, the impact side, we really need to not lose, lose sight on. Just touching on the afternoon, I, th I think, um, you know, certainly a theme related to integrity management principles, risk management, um, performing risk assessments and using a risk-based approach. Uh, certainly in what California has recently issued uh, this past Friday, and it was discussed earlier, I think elements of risk management are, are quite valid as we uh, move forward. You know, and they, uh, topics like design factor, which was really kind of a squishy area. Uh, it's pretty well defined for pipelines, but it's not really defined for underground storage. So what should that be? How close to the design envelope do you, do you allow things to go? Again, it's well defined for pipelines. We need to have, uh, we need to establish that uh, when we're dealing with underground storage. And with that, you know, how do you address anomalies? How do you, you know, how do you know what you have? The documentation aspect of it. So, I think that's a theme as far as um, you know, really managing the overall risk. Really, to have a valid risk management, you need to know what you have, um, and then just to establish boundaries around that. Uh, also related to tools, tools, tools you use to, you know, assess. Uh, wells. Um, there are numerous tools. I think, you know, they were identified quite well. We need to use those tools, and we need to use the right tools. And I think, um, you know, right now it appears, you know, there's varying degrees of use. Of course, that reflects, you know, the lack of a, a standard uniform regulation nationwide, but I think, you know, as we go forward, we'll look to establishing expectations for that. I know the RP uh, that we've discussed, 1170, 1171, 
deal with that already to some extent, but we need to do a better job of using the tools at our disposal. And it hasn't really been, uh, it may have come up a couple of times, but um, we're having a conversation now, and actually a lot is being done uh, on a, uh, an area uh, called safety management systems and the new APIRP 1173 on safety management. Uh, certainly that has a role in underground storage as we move forward, so I would look to um, invoke uh, pr um, principles of SMS as we look forward to uh, managing these, uh, you know, this infrastructure out there. Uh, the states and participation by states today has been much appreciated. Certainly, uh, we commit to you as we move forward. We'll work uh, together moving forward with our current partners that we've enjoyed for, for a long time with the states, but then as we develop new partnerships with new agencies within the states. Uh, that's in a whole area that we're looking at now as we've been reauthorized and looking at uh, setting up those partnerships and grant programs to, uh, to uh, have oversight in this area at the state level on the, for intrastate facilities. Also, it was touched on a bit, um, but related to training and qualification. You know, the work that's being done on these wells, it's, it's important that it's done by qualified people. Uh, our regulations do currently cover that. I would expect that as we, um, you know, as we move into regulating underground storage, that that will also be covered. But, you know, I just want to make sure it's covered and on the record that that will, that will be addressed as, as we look forward. Um, and then on our side, I, I might add too, just in the know-how on the federal and state uh, side, there's a lot going on internally. We have a team that's been stood up uh, to uh, help um, develop our internal policies as we move forward in underground storage. Part of that involves a new training curriculum at our facility in Oklahoma City. So a lot of work's being done in that area, and that training facility trains the federal and state inspectors. Um, so we're, we'll be developing that as we move forward. You know, in summary, I just say we need to, you know, collectively, we're all partners in this. We need to learn from what's happened at Aliso Canyon. And not only that, you know, I don't want to be lost in the annals of history what happened in 1994 when we had a public meeting, and after that we decided not to proceed with rulemaking. You know, and there were valid points at the time. I think at the time it was hoped or expected that there would be uh, a certain level of safety, you know, and oversight that would happen going forward. I know a lot of that happened, but it, again, it was probably, it was not a uniform national standard that we're hoping, we're looking to develop here uh, as we move forward. I think with that, that kind of summarizes some of the points that I made. Perhaps there are others. And with that, I would encourage you to comment on our docket uh, that I had up earlier, at regulations.gov, and also on the meeting link. There's a, on the meeting webpage, there's a link to uh, post comments to the docket. So I encourage you to put those, to comment on our docket. If you have other input, we welcome it. You know, to that end, you know, we came here to communicate. We came here to listen. We just are wowed with what we've heard today, in the last three days for that matter. We really appreciate the uh, input, the, the very uh, well thought out presentations that were, 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 that were presented, that were covered, uh, you know, that covered the, the gamut from, I mean, the public side, the impacts of Aliso Canyon, to some, a lot of the technical side. Very impressive. I think we have a lot of good information. And we've established, we are establishing that public record that we need to uh, help us move forward. Uh, also, I'd like to thank the presenters. Let's have another round of applause for all the presenters. <laughs> you know, we appreciate that you have a day job and uh, it takes time out of your busy schedules to come here. To, uh, we appreciate that very, very much. Um, and we couldn't have done this workshop without you. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the Department of Energy and the DOE Labs for their uh, uh, two-day workshop and their participation and, and collaboration with us on uh, this important, these important issues. And then, of course, the appreciation to our state partners who have been involved today and then our future state partners that we look forward to uh, working with as we uh, look to improve uh, underground nat natural gas storage safety. And let's see, as far as, you know, the team to put this on, you know, it, it's, it's no small feat to put these things on, these workshops on. So, you know, my thanks go out to Steve Nanny, who many of you have dealt with, uh, Jim Merritt, who's been on site here. He actually works for us locally here in Colorado. 
uh, Zaid Obadi, who's been on the back monitoring the web, and then, of course, Ken Lee, our Director of Engineering. Thanks so much. So, a round of applause for you guys. <laughs> and also appreciate Maritrice, uh, who's still with us. Appreciate your leadership in this area and guidance as we move forward. Um, I know it's very important to all of us, in including yourself. Uh, and then, you know, again, uh, appreciate your attendance today. Well, I meant to mention we've had, uh, if you look at the numbers, about 160 present. Now, we don't have 160 here now. We probably have maybe 40 less than that. I don't know, 50 less. Uh, on the webcast this morning, we peaked at about 158 on the webcast. And then in the afternoon, we've been running about 125. So really a, a good uh, participation. OK, with that, um, I think we'll call it a day. And I will wish you safe travels back home. So thanks again for your participation. Thank you.